and that you are what you ain't. May your friends be real and never be fake. May your rent never have to be late. And may your health always be great. May Allah forgive every sin. Now and forever if you falter again. And may you always stay close with your kin. And may he make all your enemies friends. May he make reality of your plans. May your present be pleasant. May you have a good end. May your heart be purified of his flaws. And may you act according to the laws that were revealed in the book of Allah. And may he catch you whenever you fall. May the one guide you to the truth. And when you doubt, may he show you the proof. May you be like the Ahala Suf. With the wisdom of the elders, the energy of the youth. May he accept your prayers and your fast. The very first, all the way to the last. And remove obstacles that you have. And may you receive everything that you ask. May you never have regret for your past. And receive mercy, not the wrath. And as you travel down your personal path, may you always have a reason to laugh. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Youth Empowerment and Positive Role Models, in which has been organized as a part of the Islamophobia Awareness Month. Thank you for taking time out and being here today. Firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed, and I would be your host for this evening. And the things I'd like to say about myself are, this is a passion of mine, and I'd like to stay here doing this. I'd like to be doing these webinars. I'd like to be doing these panelists. It's fun being here with all these new people. But um, there are four things I need to say before we can start. Attendees are automatically muted and videos are turned off when joining Zoom webinars. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch after the event. We will love to hear from you. Please note that there's no chat function, which may be familiar to many Zoom users, but there is a QA function in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, in which you can use throughout the webinar. We will be reviewing and responding to written questions via this um, Q&A um, function. To post a question, please click on the Q&A tab and write your question. Your question will be read out and answered live by the webinar panelists at the end. This is live, so please be patient. But our guest speakers are here with us today. Roxana Fayez Obi, the, the mayor of Newham. Claire Clinton, director of religious education and RS. RSHE Rematters, Omar Soha, founder and CEO of Ramadan Tent Project, Councillor Marion Dawood, Mohammed Rafi, detached senior youth worker, and Councillor Nilifuk um, Jahan. I'd like to introduce the co host. Um, Councillor Taryn, um, Terence Paul, Cap, um, over to you. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor Terry Paul, and me and Mohammed are going to be with you tonight. We are your Anton Deck of Newham, and we're going to gu guide you through tonight's um, event, which is fantastic. And what I would like to say, I'm a Newham boy myself. Uh, obviously, I'm from Canning Town originally, 
and I went to school at St Bonds. I love Newham and I'm really a fantastic event tonight. I'm really glad to be here and I'm glad to be the wingman for Mohammed because he's really the star of the show tonight. I um, oh, just want to say a, a couple of things. Um, there's a hashtag going around. It should be on the screen, it's not on this one, but it's I am 2020 and just make sure you put at Newham London. So tweet your comments and, and give your feedback today. So let's enjoy tonight's activities and thank you. Um, so we're going to go on tonight and we've got a short film, which Mohammed, you're going to introduce the film, aren't you? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. You introduce the film? Outside the box. This animation explores Islam on university campuses around, uh, across the UK and brings to life vital academic research constructed by soul, um, soul based research project called Representing Islam on Campus. The video was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the RH, the RHARS, and the Economic and Social Research Council, based at SOAS and in com and in collaboration with Coventry University, Durham University, and Lanchester University, and was created with positive negatives. The role of art and creative direction was fulfilled by Sahab Sabah Khan, who is a Newham resident. Over to you. Okay, so we're just going to play the video now. Mm -hmm. Evangelos, have you got the video there? We we'll have a short technical problem here. Should have the video playing. Sorry, like I may have accidentally pressed the stop video button. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Far away. It's all good. See it, say it, sort it. Sympathy? You must be kidding me. No entry. They look like letterboxes. We want our country back. Fake news. Historically, universities have been places of inquiry, debate and growth. Is that the case for everyone? We conducted a survey with over 2,000 students attending around 90% of UK universities. And we interviewed over 200 students and staff where we asked, what is your experience of Islam on campus? These are their words. All the things that society tends to put on Muslims manifest itself on campus. I originally thought it was down to a lack of diversity, but I came to this university and people say the same things, just more eloquently. People think either I've been forced to wear it, or I don't have an understanding, or I need to be liberated by someone else. It's an oppressive article of clothing. The first thing that comes to my mind? A bomb thrower. Arab equals Muslims, Muslims equal terrorists. Stop! I've reached a point where it's tiring to constantly justify my spiritual practices, like why I pray or cover. I love my abayas and dresses. They're a part of how I choose to express my identity. People should be able to accommodate that. Launched in 2003, PREVENT, one strand of the UK government's counter-terrorism strategy, aims to address the underlying causes of terrorist acts and radicalisation. It has been criticised for targeting and demonising Muslims. How does this play out on campus? The irony for me is, you asked to look for signs of change and to prevent? We're in a university. That's what students come here to do. I wanted to take out some books on Islam, just to explore my religion, but I decided against it in case I get in trouble. I got my friend who is white to take them out for me instead. It just felt safer that way. It's not just about Islam either. People who may be beginning to express questions about authority, about foreign policy, wider political issues. One of the things a university provides is a forum for debate, or at least it should do. Radicalized thinking happens only when you have a very narrow understanding of Islam. In academic institutes, this is less likely to happen. When you talk to your lecturers, they broaden your understanding of religion. 
This has been my best seminar so far. It's taught by a Muslim academic who teaches gender studies and sexual equality. For the first eight weeks, she set a reading curriculum of mostly Muslim writers. I was like, hallelujah, alhamdulillah. Oh my gosh, she's so inspiring. In her class, you can discuss religion and its cultural proliferation. You can discuss these things. How can we understand one another? So if I ask you why you wear the hijab and what it means to you, I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't. I'm just trying to find out why it's important for you. If you ask me why I'm wearing it, then I should be able to ask you why you're wearing jeans. Also, it's not as straightforward as simply being curious. If you're asking why, as if this doesn't look like it belongs here, then that's not a neutral question, and it's moving towards prejudice. I wouldn't ask after two or three lunches together. I'd ask after breaking bread maybe 10 times. Religion is a very personal thing for a lot of people. It gives them strength. It's the reason they're surviving or why they're waking up every day. The current media representation of Islam that surrounds us is very simplistic. And if students can't hear the complex version of religions and culture at university, then where else will they hear it? How can we honor each other's complexity and ensure we all belong? I can't, I'm going to, that's fine. I'm unable to turn my video on for some reason because, um, but, oh, here we go. Start my video. Okay, lovely. I think that was a very, very powerful um, video there. Mm -hmm. I agree. So it really sort of crystallised why we're here um, today at this great event. I'm just going to introduce each of the speakers and, and then Mohammed will actually get the speaker to speak. I'll just say a couple of words about each person. Now, the next person is someone I know, but actually I've found out a few things about her. It's the mayor, Roxana Fiaz, the mayor of Newham. And what I will say about her, um, some of you may or may not know, she was a national coordinator for the Steve Lawrence family campaign. But also, interestingly, what I found out about Roxana, it's interesting you find out, but she was the executive director of a national charity work with young people to build bridges amongst Muslim and Jewish students at university campus across the UK. And also she was a CEO I, in charge of an international um, global organization, which is a charity which promoted interfaith and global citizenship across the world and a really great project and worked in collaboration with the Commonwealth Secretariat. So that's a really something I didn't know about Roxana, but over to Mohammed, you're next. Um, um, Roxana Fayez. Um, hello. 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 Miss Roxana um, Fayez, um, the mayor of Newham. Over to you, Roxana. Over to you, Roxana. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and um, thanks, Terry, for the surprising words about the things that you have found out about me. And I just wanted to firstly uh, thank you both, and Mohammed especially, for the um, great event that you are both hosting today. And as you uh, both know, uh, issues of discrimination and injustice and you know, the experience of minoritized and marginalized communities is really important for my administration of which Terry is a senior member of the cabinet. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we're able to host a series of events to mark Islamophobia Awareness Month uh, this year. And it's part of a raft of things that we're doing to bring better understanding and illuminate on the uniqueness uh, and beauty of our community here in Newham and I know that um, in the context of video which was similar similarly I found it very powerful it evoked many feelings and many uh, reflections of my work 
on university campuses working with young people uh, across different religious groups uh, who were contending with some of these challenging issues relating to prevent and what that meant in terms of self-identity and also community identity, both community identity in the context of one's religious identity and being part of a, um, a UK-wide faith community, um, but also how that manifested in terms of how individuals uh, and as a group uh, Muslim students were treated uh, and how it uh, led to, for too many students, a, um, a sense that they had to regulate and not be able to engage in discourse and in that intellectual inquiry that university life is all about. Um, today's session is around positive role models and as uh, someone who grew up in the Muslim faith who practices who is Muslim who identifies as Muslim um, I know that the uh, role models uh, that were available for me to look up to and be inspired by uh, were very limited when I was growing up and I drew my strength and my inspiration from uh, members of my immediate family and I must give a shout out to my mother but also uh, my brothers and my sister uh, alongside really powerful uh, women uh, from my community, women that were pioneering women that broke our ceilings and in a similar vein, uh, me finding myself as a, um, you know, a leader of a significant large local authority, uh, you know, I recognise the fact that one, I stand on the shoulder of giants, uh, people that have inspired me to pursue my ambitions, uh, but also to pursue those ambitions with a profound sense of civic duty uh, and duty to humanity, which is a core facet of my faith and my faith practice, um, but also the importance uh, as I break glass ceilings that I uh, offer my hand and I make sure that others are able to follow uh, in my footsteps and are given similar opportunities. So I'm looking forward to the conversations this evening uh, to be constantly inspired because of these conversations and this dialogue uh, are core um, parts of what this administration is about and I'm really pleased to be here and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at any Q&A session but I trust Mohammed that has been an okay introduction. Thank you Akshana. Thank you Akshana. It's a very nice thing for you to say that to me. Over to you, Terence. Thank you very much. I'm just going to turn my turn my video. I won't like my video. It's not working. I'll just carry on anyway. Oh, here we go. Lovely. Thank you for that, Roxana. Um, my, our next guest tonight is somebody who I was on the training course with only a couple of months ago. And again, yeah. it's amazing what you learn about people when someone writes it down for you. Um, my next person I'm going to introduce is Claire Clinton who's Director of Religious Studies and, and Relationships and Sex and Health at RA Letters. And Claire has lived and worked in Newham for over 17 years and the last 16 years at the local authority, Religious Education Advisor. Claire is obviously passionate about inclusive religious education and people's voice. And she leads a group locally which brings students together from across the school's network on projects on around religion and world views. And it's great to welcome Claire tonight. and. Um, over to you, Mohammed. over to you. Oh, well, I'd like to introduce Claire Clinton, Director of Religious Education. Over to you, Claire. Evening, everyone. Lovely to be with you. And um, yes, when, Terry, just so you know, when Roxana was at that charity, she employed me to do some oh. webinars with her. <laughs> so so we, we all go back away, don't we, Roxana? But anyway, um, as, as you heard, I've, I've lived in Newham for a long time and um, moved here on purpose. Uh, my children have been educated in Newham in nursery, primary school and secondary school. Uh, they're both now at uh, universities um, and I'm delighted to be here and I, it's really, I've just tweeted actually about that film and uh, I will get as many schools to know about that because actually I think that could 
really start some interesting discussions in some classrooms about freedom of speech and how people feel and how others perceive themselves. So you've heard a little bit from uh, Mohammed and Terry. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. My work um, is all around religious education and helping pupils to understand the complexity of religion and worldview. So not just about those who are religious, but also those who have ways of life who maybe don't believe in God, or maybe they do believe in God, but then wouldn't adhere to one of uh, the many 200 different religions that we have uh, sort of organized throughout the world um, as systems. And actually that's complex work and it's nuanced work. And it's so important in there that um, young people have role models. So people like Roxana, you know, as the first uh, sort of female uh, mayor uh, is, is a great example. Um, it shows all sorts of people what's possible. And uh, role models are really, really important. Now, I want to share a little bit about a recent project that I've worked on uh, with the group that Terry was mentioning. I run a, a group that brings together young people in Newham across about 10 different secondary schools and they work on a project, they decide the project. And I think one of the really important things if we want to see changes is allowing young people like Mohammed and others to have their voice and to be able to have enough support to be able uh, to, to say the things they want and to look at the issues they want to look at. And about three years ago, you'll remember we had those horrible points in life where we had terrorist attacks happening very close to us. And uh, this brought up for many of the young people uh, issues that they have felt uh, around Islamophobia and to do with some other religions where they felt also that people judged them in negative ways because of outward symbols or because of ways of life. And I started a project called Bullying and Belief. Now, the really exciting thing three years on is that because of some funding from different charities nationally and with the support of the Anti-Bullying Alliance um, across the UK, we've launched a toolkit uh, and Newham is the first place to produce a toolkit around anti-religious bullying. And I think that's really, really important. It's important whether you're living in a diverse place like Newham, but especially if you're like me, someone who grew up on the Isle of Wight, where there wasn't a lot of diversity, it was white in more than the way that you spell it for the island. Um, and actually learning about difference and learning about people is really important because then otherwise the only messages you have are those really from the media. And as we know, social media is particularly good at fake news and we can get into echo chambers and all sorts of things on social media that don't provide us with facts and information. So that's what I liked about that So As film because it's actually providing facts and information. Well, on this project, uh, one of the things that happened to one of our Muslim pupils, and it's not a very nice thing, um, she was part of one of our Muslim private schools. She was walking along a road in Newham and she got spat at. And she was spat at because she was wearing a hijab. And then the young gentleman who spat at her walked behind her and spoke about her as they walked behind her. And they talked about how ugly she must be for her ha family to have to cover most of her face and cover up her body. And uh, as part of the project that we worked on, this bullying and belief project, the pupils all got a chance. There were about 80 pupils on this project. They had a chance to work with a, a poet for a day as a special, um, I suppose, a special day for the pupils. And I want to play you the performance poem that uh, this young lady wrote as she had time to think about what had happened to her and what she wanted to say back to these uh, young men, uh, ignorant young men, but also about how this experience had changed her for the better and had identified uh, what she could do to be different going forward, not in the outward way that she dresses, but in her inward attitudes. So we're gonna play that for you, but I think it's important that you understood um, 
sort of the context of the poem that she wrote. And it's done as a performance piece with lots of different pupils from our schools in Newham. And I'll tell you a little bit more about where you can find more of their work at the end of this. So um, I think, there you go, as if by magic, there it is. My problem 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 is not what comes out of your mouth. Not the lies you live by. I am not bothered by your perception of me. Because I am worth more than this body you are quick to judge. This outfit, my figure, is a distorted shadow. I have two countries growing within me. I wear my religion like a halo around my head. I glow like a firefly and blood flushes and brings life to my skin. Your skin is dry. You cannot get to what you cannot touch in me. You cannot make me echo the grief that I do not share with you. This body is my temple and I have birds singing off key within me. I didn't ask you to sing along. Sing with me or don't sing at all. Love me or don't love me at all. But do not shout out your bullet words at me as I walk away. I am everything that's tried to silence me. Bullets that have caught between my teeth. I have a dragon growing under my tongue. A phoenix in my heart. Do not tell me I am not beautiful. Your definition of beauty is sugar-coated in lies. The rags you made in me, you have only brought more light into me. Because I am worth more than this body you are quick to judge. So the, the poem uh, starts and finishes with Anjan speaking those words and it's so powerful it moves me every time I um, look at it and I hate the fact that someone's had that experience here in Newham but I love the fact that actually empowering young people allows them to process uh, negative as well as positive things that have happened to them, but also to find their voice. And finding your voice is really important in overcoming stereotypes, and particularly where people want to discriminate or uh, we, we face persecution or prejudice about who we are. Um, so Terry, you will have liked that because you will have seen some of the St Bonds boys in there being part of that performance piece as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important that those different schools, whether it's a private Muslim school, uh, a maintained Roman Catholic school, are getting together and coming together and talking through issues and learning from one another. So I suppose, um, I think in the chat, they're going to give you the link to the um, RE Matters uh, YouTube channel. You can find lots of other videos there. There's one, there's a great one there uh, where um, the different faith leaders talk about how we should respect and how we should treat people from different faiths and none. And there's some lovely quotations in there by all our different Newham faith leaders. And I'm so grateful for this partnership. And I suppose that's what it takes to overcome something like Islamophobia. It's not about us in silos working it's about us coming together and actually together we can change things for our young people and and I think people like Roxana and so many others are such important role models for our young gentlemen our young ladies in Newham who have that Muslim upbringing that Muslim background that they get to meet Muslims who look different from them from different cultures from different racial groups from different places sometimes from different denominations, so that they understand that bigger part of what they are part of, but also that they have those opportunities to have conversations and meet people um, who may look different from them and may have a different religious background, but actually they can share many things in common. So that's the delight wo delightful world that I live in every day. And it's a real privilege always to work with young people but role models are the big thing for me. Thanks. Can I, can I thank you, Claire? That was powerful. And that's what I will say. There is never too much St. Bonds in Newham. Let me just get that on the record. But I just want to pick up one thing from the video. There was a quote, I am everything that has tried to silence me. And I, I couldn't write fast enough, but there were other more powerful quotes there. But also I would say, perhaps outside of this, that video needs to go wider because there's a lot there which I didn't get in. But for me, I everything that has tried to silence me, I felt it's a, a very, very powerful 
segment there. So can I thank you, Claire, for that and some very important messages. And I think that video needs to go wider because even I learned it and never too much St. Bond's Boys always makes the video very good. Thank you, Claire. I just <laughs> want to go on to the next bit and my computer is just frozen, but no problem. I'm going to introduce our next um, speaker. Here we go. And that is um, Omar Soha, who's a PhD scholar at SOAS, which is part of the University of London. And he's a research fellow at the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy there, and a founder and the CEO of the Ramadan, Ram, the Ramadan 10 project. What I'm going to do is, I'm just going to read, if you don't mind, um, Omar's profile, because there's a lot there, and I don't want to miss it. So Omar is an MA graduate in International Studies and Diplomacy and was awarded the PhD scholarship for the study of integration of Muslims in British society. His first academic chapter published by Routledge is titled Diplomacy and the Beautiful Game, Muslim Footballers as Ambassadors of Faith. Omar regularly delivers talks, workshops and lectures in leading academic and professional institutions and conferences around the world. He's also a faculty member for the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project at University College Berkeley, which is in America. And on, he also founded the Ramadan Tent Project in 2013, which is a social enterprise dedicated to serving young people in the wider community um, through open spaces of spirituality, dialogue, empowerment. But also, um, he was appointed a fellow of the Royal Academy, Royal Society of Arts, and his claim to fame is a keen football and sports enthusiast, and his greatest achievement to date in the world is scoring a penalty across um, against professional football coach Jose Moreno. Wow. Um, fantastic. And Omar, I hope I've done you justice in how great you are. And Mohammed, let's introduce our next great guest. Um, let me introduce Omar um, Soha. Oh, over to you, Omar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mohammed, And uh, thank you very much, Terry. That's very, very kind of you. Um, but I'm actually honestly surrounded by great uh, people um, this evening. And uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be surrounded um, by those who are very, very passionate about young people. And tonight um, it's about talking about young people and empowering young people. And of course, um, the topic of role models, uh, which I think is a poignant uh, title, given that this is uh, obviously Islamophobia Awareness Month. But it's always an, an opportunity for us to look at how we can be positive, um, how we can build bridges and how we actually see this as a challenge, but also an opportunity for us to address a very poignant and very important topic. Um, as we've probably seen uh, images and pictures over the summer um, of, of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement um, in the US, which of course spiraled across the UK and of course across the globe uh, for people around the world to stand in solidarity shoulder to shoulder on such an important uh, issue of uh, racial inequality and seeking justice. And I think it's really in interesting and important that um, we are all share a very common feature, which is uh, striving and seeking justice, which is at the heart of our cause. Um, when we talk about Islamophobia Awareness Month, or we talk about Black Lives Matter, it is trying to rebalance the, uh, the field. And whether that's on an individual, structural, institutional level, we see uh, several inequalities, which we try to address through different and various means. Um, whether it's through the power of film, whether it's through the power of poetry, um, whether it's through the power of the arts, um, uh, as we have seen some of the examples this evening. Um, and this is where the story of Ramadan 10 project was born out of. It was born out of the idea that Ramadan is the holiest month of the Islamic calendar. And it is an opportunity for many, many Muslims, those who are observing the fast across the globe, approximately 1.7 billion Muslims across the globe, uh, who observe the fast for 30 days. And it is a time for them to reconnect with their spirituality, to, to rekindle that spirit um, with their creator, and of course, to attain God consciousness and, and awareness and consciousness uh, of their creator, but also of their surrounding, of the, of the nature and the environment they live in. And so for us, it was a great opportunity to uh, start this idea 
uh, of creating neutral spaces of people of uh, all faiths and none to come together to build bridges and to create better understanding. Um, Ramadan 10 Project's mission is to bring communities together to better understand each other. Um, and uh, the vision is to live in a world uh, in, in harmony and where pe all people belong. And that key word of belonging is accepting uh, each person as they are completely, uh, not to be uh, um, um, looked at uh, any less uh, or try to be uh, assimilated without taking, taking away any potential of their identity and culture and heritage, but on the contrary, to accept one completely as they are. And so Ramadan 10 Project's flagship initiative, Open Iftar, which are some of the images you saw on the slide, um, where uh, um, it's an annual initiative in Ramadan, which brings together thousands of people to break bread, to have free food, to engage in conversations and discussions and have ins inspirational speakers every single evening. Uh, to date, since 2013, over 100,000 people have been hosted in the UK and also, it also expanded to several cities and continents across the globe. Uh, most notably, um, just before coronavirus, of course, this Ramadan was very, very different. Uh, it was spent uh, at home and, of course, in self-isolation and, of course, done through our uh, iconic virtual liftars, which many of us are now accustomed to as we are doing this event as well online. Uh, but in 2019, uh, we had the amazing honor and, and, and the very, very proud moment to organize some really iconic events, some which uh, were held at Wembley Stadium, um, the British Library, Westminster Abbey, uh, Trafalgar Square and Southwark Cathedral. And these were bringing together thousands of people all together to celebrate the rich cultural uh, heritage of Ramadan in this country, but also at iconic British institution and landmarks. And that is a strategic move for us to actually try to be able to bridge between national, local partners and to bring together different communities who may have been, may have not visited a museum uh, ever in their life, especially young people, for instance, in those particular areas across the city of London and across the UK, where we also reached out to Newcastle, Gateshead, to Manchester, to Bradford, um, uh, less than Birmingham and elsewhere. And so for us, a key component of us achieving belonging and achieving greater understanding between one another is having those difficult conversations to, able, to be able to actually build those bridges, but also people to have the courage and the leadership to walk across these bridges. Um, so much so that we actually find ourselves uh, looking at um, trying to uh, create an infrastructure which allows better engagement. But I ask you this, in an interconnected world, how connected are we? Uh, we find ourselves with the use of technology, with the use of media, we still find ourselves that, of course, there's been the rise of populism across Europe and the US. And that still we see this as a challenge which we must uh, seek to address. So there are two ways of going about doing this. Uh, those who are uh, for engagement will need to build bridges. So that's building those uh, connections. And those who seek to actually seek division will seek to try to break those. So it's as simple as whether we want to seek a society of belonging or seek a society of othering. And so Ramadan 10 Project is just a, an example of an organization that seeks to address and re, re, readdress the imbalance that we see, but also doing so through exchange. And that's a very key word, uh, an exchange of ideas, an exchange of whether it be in sports and arts and movies, in, in, the, in the cultural sector, in the education, of course. And some of the innovative things that we thought about uh, this year, of course, is not only doing virtual iftars, but also having the opportunity to put together these interesting Ramadan packs, which were sent out to people's homes and schools to celebrate the uh, festival of Ramadan in their own spaces. So I leave you with a couple of quotes, which I find really to be inspirational myself. I actually don't believe or, or don't promote the term role models. I'd rather promote the term real models. I don't believe it's a role one should emulate to play, but rather if one is real with themselves and, and actually is a real model, then actually we look at the extraordinary things that, pe that ordinary people are doing. And so 
Professor Cornell West in the US uh, has a quote, uh, and, and I'll paraphrase here, who says, we did a mistake when we talk about young people, the older generation giving advice to the young people, which was to be successful, successful, and successful. However, what we really should have told young people was to be great, to be great, to be great, because that is a qualitative uh, uh, method and a qualitative way of living as opposed to uh, uh, being successful. And so I want to end on that and actually remind all young people that you know, we should not be chasing uh, uh, great heroes. We should be sh chasing great ideas. And the best of ideas are those with the young people. Thank you. That was fantastic, Omar. Thank you. Let's turn my video on. Uh, and again, um, you mentioned C Cornel West. He's also somebody who's quite provocative in what he says. But something you said, which, which made me think, you talked about we have to build bridges, but also more importantly, we must be able to walk across the bridge. And I think that's a very salient point. And also in all what we do and what we're talking about tonight is about making sure that we're all part of the same society. And for me, it's about trying to understand that the other person's shoes, trying to understand life from the other person's perspective. So can I thank you for that? And I, and I love that analogy. We must be able to walk across the bridge, It's not just about building the bridge, and, um, and well done for scoring the goal against Mourinho. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next, our next um, panellist tonight is someone I'm really honoured um, to introduce, who's also one of my colleagues um, on Neum Council, and that's Councillor Marion Darwood, who was elected as the youngest councillor ever on, on Neum Council um, uh, last time in, in 2018 in the Manor Park Ward. And also, more importantly, we have a real star dynamic. She was shortlisted for the Local Government Information Unit, which is a really big national organisation, as the best councillor of the year, not just in Newham, not just in London, not just in England, the whole of the UK, right? She was shortlisted, and that must be about 25,000 councillors, you know, and roughly in terms of, you know, that's a lot of people she was shortlisted. And she's currently studying for a master's degree in international relations from the LSC, which is the London School of Economics, which is a really great university in London, and political science. So, Mohammed, our next great panelist, over to you. Um, I'd like to introduce Councillor Mariam Dalwood. Uh, over to you, Mariam. Thank you for that kind introduction. And um, honestly, I feel lucky to be here surrounded by my role models, or as Omar said, real models, including and especially you, Terry. Thank you. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about my own background and how I got involved in politics myself. So for me, um, growing up in a Muslim household, there was uh, an understanding that our religion is about equality and um, those beliefs affected uh, the way that I engaged in society and the values that I had. Uh, they're why I joined the Labour Party at 15, despite the fact that none of my family had been engaged in electoral politics before. I really saw it as a way of making a difference in my community. And growing up in Newham, you often hear about the opportunities that you're lacking compared with other boroughs. Um, and I wanted to do something to change that. And actually, in the last few years, we have found with uh, this administration that a lot has been uh, tackled and dealt with to encourage um, greater equality in our borough, not least through um, events like this and talk about um, difficult topics like Islamophobia, um, having that, those awkward conversations about what's going on within our council, what's going on locally, politically, is something that is really encouraged in the administration we're in now. So um, actually the first meeting that I went to that was run by my local party uh, included Roxana, who was there. So I immediately got to see someone who um, I could relate to in some way as another young Western woman at the time. But I have to say that it was the mentorship and the encouragement from one of my local councillors, Councillor Celine Patel, who uh, encouraged me to, to get involved with community campaigns, who encouraged me to speak at meetings, who platformed me sometimes instead of himself, uh, that gave me the confidence to continue doing that and to stand for election in 2018. 
So as soon as I was elected, um, it became one of my missions to do the same, to do what he did for me for other young people. So I've gone around the borough and across London schools actually speaking with young people. Uh, one of those schools is St. Bonds, as Terry knows. Uh, and uh, what I found is really interesting. Um, young people want to engage and want to talk about politics and actually understand complex issues better than we might ordinarily think. But actually, I've had so many events where no questions are asked until older colleagues have left the room or until it's just me about to, to leave a classroom and I'll have several young people chase me out, asking me a ton of questions. So when we hear about uh, young people and what they like and, and their interests, when politicians talk about how uh, young people think, wh how, what we believe, it's actually often, um, it's one of my bugbears I'd say because what we need is more young people being able to speak for themselves rather than having uh, necessarily representation from others. Uh, that's one of the things that I would really like to add to this discussion that what we need is a lot more young people speaking about what they believe and what they'd like to see, but also um, challenging the ideas around um, representation in politics and uh, especially as a young Muslim woman, how the intersectionality between being young and being Muslim and being a woman affects the way that one approaches politics. So for example, um, when I was first elected, I had a lot of uh, colleagues, I would say, speaking honestly, who would call my male colleagues to ask them for uh, my uh, understanding of the topic or for my support on a policy that needed to be passed and actually uh, those colleagues of mine challenged the assumptions that I would listen to older male colleagues of mine because um, those assumptions are not just misogynistic but also rooted in the fact that as a Muslim woman it's seen that I would obey what an older um, male figure would tell me so having um, not just Muslim allies but others within the council and in my workplace, challenging um, Islamophobic tendencies, even if they're uh, projected by Muslims themselves, has or has been necessary, but also has been, um, has been good. Um, so I would just like to end by like thanking, um, Thank you for allowing me to say something. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mariam. That's fantastic. And just to, you know, two things you said there that struck a chord was one, it's important to provide a platform for others. And that is, you know, that's a really beautiful way of, of saying how you were supported by other people. And the other thing which you said which really struck a chord was the issue of intersectionality and how it's important to challenge assumptions. And, and I think that was a very powerful thing you said, and hopefully in some of the questions, we can explore those themes a little bit more. But thank you, Marion, and we'll probably come back in the questions, some of those themes, but really some great insights there into your journey of being a counsellor. Thank you. And we're gonna go on to our next speaker now, and, and that is um, Mohammed Rafi who's a detached senior youth worker. I, I'm, what I will say on this, one of the mayor's main objectives and ambitions of when she became mayor, and actually that's a really apt picture there, was to really, you know, improve our youth service. To, and the mayor's got a phrase, we're gonna make Newham the best person in the country, or she says the world, for a young person to grow up in. And what we didn't do in the past in Newham was put our money where our mouths are and to support the infrastructure to allow young people to flourish. So on a personal level, I want to say welcome to Mohammed because obviously I've seen some of the proposals on a spreadsheet and, and now Mohammed Rafi is with us, but also just to say on, on the new and detached youth work, they're based primarily, primarily in Stratford, providing youth work on the street, and you may have seen them. And they're around on the streets and the parks, on the pitches and the shops on the malls, 
providing that support to our young people. And their really support, as we know, is to engage these young people and to provide some support to at times some of the most vulnerable people. And what I'll just say in a final comment before Mohammed introduces Mohammed is during COVID, which has been a difficult time for us, you know, I will say the, the detached youth offer and the service has been fantastic. So I think you should be saluted. And, um, and Mohammed, over to you to introduce Mohammed. I would like to, to I would like to introduce Mohammed Rafi, detached senior youth worker. Come on out. Okay. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Terry. Um, uh, Terry, I think you've, you've sort of um, uh, started off my first sort of initial speech. I was going to sort of start off with thanking uh, the mayor in, in regards to the sort of reinvestment of um, in the youth service um, and, and, and sort of following on from your comments. Um, New was one of the first boroughs in many years. I mean, the youth service have gone through many cuts, many sort of, um, you know, redundancy. I've seen a lot of colleagues uh, lose jobs and so forth. Uh, and to see Newham recognizing the importance of um, the youths within the community and, and the need to reinvest and support our, our young people um, was, you know, uh, uh, when, the, when the jobs went out, I was uh, initially in Barnet for 10 years. And when I saw the adverts and I saw the vision for you and I said you know what I, I, I want to be part of it and uh, this is something um, that sort of struck out to me and this, I, I prepared hard for that interview um, to try and be part of this and, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for that and I'm thankful thankful to Lynn who's the director and, and also also the mayor to you know uh, to give me this opportunity to be part of, of, of this new journey. Um, I want to touch on today in terms of um, my sort of journey to youth work, um, being a British Bangladeshi Muslim, and how I um, came into youth work uh, and, and, and my journey uh, through that. And I'm, you know, um, I want to touch on the youth empowerment and the importance of, of, of empowering young people, engaging, educating, and giving young people the opportunity to, to, to voice, to um, be able to shape, change, and make change. Um, uh, local level to national level um, and also touch on sort of positive role models uh, and, and, and I agree what, with what Omar sort of said um, uh, in, in regards to you know um, real models you know we need to lead by example um, uh, you, uh, 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 and I'll go into that context and I hope I'm going to share a PowerPoint and I hope um, that it will give you an idea about um, the sort of importance of empowerment empowering our young people and the importance of having positive um, real models or role models. Um, I'll, I'll just share screen now. Everyone able to see that? Yep, good. Great. Um, so again, I've, I've sort of touched on this. Um, so this is me at sort of 10, 11 years old. I had to dig this out, it took me a while to find it. Um, I, I, I came to this, to, to the UK at the age of sort of 9, 10, and um, pretty large family, um, eight siblings, um, and moved to the UK. At this age, this was a cr sort of crucial age for me in, in terms of um, being new to UK, not knowing the language, being it, you know, having to settle in, in, in a new community. Um, so I started going to school, um, years went by, I started um, sort of learning the, learning the language um, and, you know, integrating into the community uh, in a way. Um, the thing that at this sort of period of time, uh, when I was sort of 12, 13, um, my parents, my dad was working 24 hours, you know, they provided for me, you know, they provide for the whole family um, in terms of, you know, keeping us going and dad was working um, literally 24 hours. Um, I was starting to struggle with my sort of identity, my, um, you know, I, I had my religion, I had my friends outside, 
um, and I was torn between two cultures. I had parents, my parents didn't understand the culture outside the pressures and it, and and then I had I, ha, I had this pull into in terms of you know um, being in the community but not understanding but wanting to fit in um, and I started associating with with, 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 with with groups of young people locally I used to go to the mosque uh, and we used to go to Arabic readings and in there in terms of I was looking for direction at that time um, and I started hanging about with the wrong people. Um, and and this, was, this, this was within the mosque and within the community as well. And I saw my older cousins making a lot of money. Um, and you know, that, that, that sort of attracted me in terms of like, I could, I, I could help my family out, I could, I could pay some of the bills or, you know, you know, I started getting involved into that sort of criminal behavior, criminal activity in terms of trying to make quick money. Uh, and that sort of drag, that, that sort of, you know, that pressure um, sort of got me to, you know, lean towards that side a bit more. Um, so at the age of sort of 14, 15, I was groomed in terms of by my older peers, by, by my peers, you know, I mean, we were sort of making this out of peer to peer, my, my, my friends were involved in it, they were making a lot of money and then I, I, I the, my, my, my cousin was, like the ring leader in terms of that. And he got me involved in sort of running. I, I was going missing from home. I was, you know, um, I, 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 I was involved in driving up to the north, um, delivering, doing deliveries and so forth. Um, but what we did was when we were in the area, we had these two annoying, at the time, youth workers who used to always try and come and talk to us. We'd think, who are these weirdos? You know, um, they used to call themselves detached youth workers. Didn't know what that meant at that time. I just thought, yeah why would they want to talk to us um but they were persistent and they were consistent um and they, they, they were always approaching us are you guys all right how are you doing today but like, yeah yeah okay we were polite to them but we just kept a barrier a distance um and we'll see them on a regular basis they'll be there in that space where, we, where we're at where you know sometimes we'll even hide from them we see them coming we'll just oh no these those youth workers you know that you know they, I think they might be spying on us or you know they, they might be working with the police undercover um yeah, so, so, so um, until this day, the reason I, I, I'll share this picture with you, this, this is a day where my life turned in terms of, um, this was a friend's party and outside the party, there was a serious fight and I was seriously injured and seriously hurt. Um, one of my friends lost, you know, I lost one of my friends that night as well. And it was then that I was, I was in hospital for two weeks and the only people that visited me, the only people that visited was, was my family, immediate families and relatives. No, no friends, well, friends at that time, you know, that I thought I looked up to, or they're looking after me, they got my back. I realized, and, 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 and those weird youth workers, they found out that, that I was seriously hurt. They came to the hospital to see me. And after that, you know, I, I, I sort of, once I got out of hospital, um, I sort of kept myself to myself, locked up in my room, went through depression, and it was that time when the youth workers would knock on the door and see if I'm okay, um, and, and then started working with me on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, coming to see if I'm okay, and started talking to me, and it started making sense, um, you know, um, and, and they were consistent, they were there, uh, and obviously after the incident, uh, you know, I had to go for a referral order and so forth. And part of my community service was was to do some gardening, uh, fix the gardening in, in the community centre where they run the youth centre. And after I finish, they'll they'll ask me to hang about because they knew that I had a reputation within that area and I had influence over other other, other young people because those young people knew what I was doing and what I was involved in and had had this, had a bit of respect in in terms of that. So. The youth worker sort of approached me and said, look, why don't you help us out? Why don't you come and help us set up or clear up and do, do a bit of volunteering? Um, at that time, I didn't know I, I was out of college. I didn't have much to do. I said, you know what? Yeah, why not? And if I get to play pool, yeah. Um, so, you know, they, they, they started working with me um, and then they supported me in terms of getting back into college. And they used me to go and reach other young people um, in terms of, you know, getting them to come in and work and, and support them. And they put me through 
various trainings and uh, and so on. So um, and since since then, as soon as I, I, I got back into college, went to uni, finished my degree, um, and as soon as I finished my uh, university degree, they offered me a full time job. And but while I, while I was at college and and um, I did my level one youth work, they gave me a part time job because they knew that I needed that support, that financial. Um, element was a drive for me at that time. Um, so, you know, um, in terms of getting me a, a part-time job, and once I finished uni, they offered me a full-time position um, within the youth centre. And, and and you know, and my mentor and my youth worker was a female white Jewish youth worker, but she understood. She she took her time to understand my faith, my religion, my family circumstances. And you know, uh, and, uh, and w was able to su support me in that. You know, um, uh, get me uh, after the incident. She, she got me back into the community, reintegrate back and get me back. You know, um, in, in terms of the mosques, the the, the friendships, um, and that support to this day. You know, uh, 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 she's still my mentor to this day. And this is why I do what I do today. Is it's helped me as a young person. Uh, to change my life around and it's possible because young people you know at the, you know at the moment there's um, this negative that's stereotype around young people or they're involved in this or i wasn't bad i wasn't as a young person i, I, I wouldn't say i was evil i was bad I, I was i was doing things out of necessity even though it was wrong i had that guilt um and as, 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 as a muslim you know i knew what i was doing was wrong i was going and praying i was going to the mosque but i was still involved in that stuff but i had that guilt um but I did it out of necessity, and and and, and I, see, I see that these young people that we're working with, we're, we're trying to reach and support, is how we can try and change the change that situation for them and give them the opportunity that I had, uh, uh, you know, to support them. And just to end it, Terry, I know I've probably gone over my time. Um, so this is me, hopefully 90 years old, still doing detective youth work still trying to support the community and empower young people. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. I, I, I know somebody who looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell you who the person is. Perhaps I'll email you and tell you and I'll show you the picture. Um, just for me, what I got from you was it is possible to change. Um, that's what you said. And for me, that sort of summarised what you were saying. And also the other thing which I got from listening to you was about your journey to where you are now. And in that journey, along that path, there are points where you've reached a crossroads, be that be the party you went to, your friend lost um, his or her life, where you're in hospital, the part-time job and the support you got, going to university and that youth worker who invested in you. So I think what I got from you and also it was the power of the youth worker, if I can use that phrase, and how you mentioned your faith a few times and how that made you reflect on how it is possible to change. So can I thank you for your observations and your humility and humanity and how you presented that and thank you I think there's a lot there so the next person uh, I'm going to choose not least and not last is another colleague of mine is Nalufa Jahan who's a counsellor uh, Nalufa is a Newham girl went to Plashett and to Newvik and she's currently the um, counsellor for Green Street East and the deputy cabinet lead for environment and sustainable transport uh, also in her day job does community engagement and public relations and also worked in the House of Laws and did some really great campaigning, setting up, you know, um, commissions and round tables and on the impact of Sharia law on women, and also raising awareness of at the time had a negative policies of the last Conservative government. So can I introduce Nalufa? Over to you. Oh, sorry, Mohammed, my, my partner in crime. Over to you. Oh, really? <laughs> Anyway, after that little um, technical difficulties, 
I would like to issue <laughs> Councillor Nilufa Jahan. Over to you. Hello, can you see me? Yes. Hi. Hi, yeah, so um, thank you for the introduction, Mohammed. You're doing a really good job, by the way. And Terry, thank you. Um, and I just want to begin by thanking all the organizers for in um, inviting me on to join the panel. Um, I'm actually very honored to, um, to speak alongside such um, great people who have dedicated their work in helping young people and actually improving interfaith dialogue. Um, when I was asked to join the panel, I, I I was thinking, I didn't know what to say because, you know, a lot of the Islamophobia that I've faced, it, you know, it's suppressed because, you know, I, it, it happened at a time when I was so eager to excel in my career and just like pursue my career that I've, you know, I've just, I've just not thought about it. So um, it wasn't until I started to really write down what I was going to say today that I've, I've thought about, you know, all these things started to come up. And I was really inspired by some of the um, conversations that we've had tonight so far. Um, I'd like to start by just saying something about my background and my career journey um, and what got me into local politics. Um, you know, just having grown up in Newham, I think I've been quite sheltered from opposing views and then views that were kind of different from mine in the sense where, you know, we're in such a multicultural community and we're exposed to such different um, religion and cultures. We didn't grow up, you know, we didn't know what was different. We didn't think that, you know, anyone was particularly different or unequal to me um, and it wasn't until I left my local space whether that was through you know moving out for uni or um, work that I really did feel different and it felt different to be a Muslim um, at a workplace that was predominantly non-Muslim um, or just non-Asian really um, in around 2013-2014 when I was starting starting my career and, you know, you really did feel the pressure to conform, you know, no social event went without having a drink. And you, you know, when, whether, whether you're at university or at work, you know, the social element of it really did surround alcohol and you felt the pressure. And, um, you know, many of you guys who are going to, who are watching tonight, you know, if you're at university or actually starting out in your career, you will face this, unfortunately. And I think, the one thing to remember is that shouldn't define you. And I'll, I'll go into that a lot later, but it wasn't, a, you know, for me, I've had friends that, you know, had to trim their beard to make themselves look less Muslim, more approachable to recruiters and employees. And, you know, at a time when it was, you know, prevent came into action, it was really important for us to kind of just appear a lot more approachable. And, you know, in hindsight, it doesn't feel, doesn't feel very nice to say that, but that was the, um, you know, that was the thought process at the time. And it wasn't until I was at the House of Lords in 2015 where I felt proud to be a Muslim. And, you know, I, I felt like I was on cruise from, you know, from my childhood until I was around 20 um, um, when I felt, okay, being a Muslim meant to actually spread the, um, spread the good work that we do and it was you know and it was when I started to assist the peer in um, raising awareness of concerns facing Muslim women and Muslim and minority ethnic groups where I met positive role models who really influenced me and supported me to pursue my um, aspirations so I understand the importance of positive role models because per you know, frankly, for me, I didn't see it was possible until I saw it for myself, until I met um, a Muslim woman who had, you know, get, you know, climbed up the ranks of seniority in her industry. I didn't feel like it was very, po it was possible for me. And, you know, ultimately my work fed into what's now known as the Change the Script, Change the Script campaign that seeks to rewrite the narrative associated with Muslim women. It essentially tackles the misconception that Muslim women are not politically, socially or financially active. Through this work, I was able to meet, you know, pioneers who advanced the progress of Muslim community, whether that was, you know, through journalism, arts, politics, or even um, corporate industry. And it was at a time, as I said, you know, um, David Cameron made his remarks about Muslim women. And it was, it was at a time where there were a lot of misconceptions around 
just Muslim, Muslim community and Muslim women who, you know, who chose to isolate themselves because they didn't learn to speak English. You know, in Newham, that's ridiculous, you know, that's ridiculous. But actually, when you step outside of Newham or to Hamlet's or, you know, or very East London boroughs, you'll see that, you know, a lot of people believed in that. So I felt that, you know, to make a positive impact and to see a real change, I should join the local council. And so far my political career, it hasn't been easy. You, you know, I didn't have pre-existing networks that I could easily tap into. And this is something that I definitely think we need, we need for our young Muslims, especially in areas such as Newham, where um, a lot of our young talent would be leaving um, college, university, and they don't know where to start. And um, we have such, rich history we have such great individuals in the borough and outside that we can you know we should tap into and i don't see why we don't we haven't created a platform where we can um you know the fact that none of my family members were remotely interested in politics um it wasn't very easy for me to take up a position that was so public facing and um so i definitely think you know one thing that i'd like to see more of is a uh, networking group for young muslims and it, it you know it doesn't need to be specific to any industry but i definitely think you know if we are really about helping young people we need to put our money where our mouth is and actually create such um such networking events and that's why i'm hugely inspired by um speakers such as um, Omar and Claire who have created platforms where people can share their um, their experience and it doesn't need to be um, specific to a religion or community. You know right now we're at a time where you know the mayor of London is a Muslim man and it's from a working class background and dare I say it, he's a son of a bus driver and you know in Newham we've got the first directly elected Muslim woman who um, in the first directly elected in the UK and Europe, I believe. So, you know, we have such positive role models. So, you know, platforms like this are so crucial and I'd like to see more of them. So, um, yeah, before, you know, before I leave today, I'd like to say, yeah, we're at a time where we do need to work 10 times harder, but um, I think one of the best things about working um, extremely hard is, you know, some of the amazing people we get to meet through our um, communications or network and so forth. And um, I'm kind of keen to see, you know, Newham take this forward in any way it can. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Yalutha. I just, just want to, something you said there resonated with something which Mariam said. Mariam said earlier on that for her it was about challenging assumptions you know, tackling that intersectionality. And what you said really chimed with that. And what I wrote down, you said the exposure to different backgrounds when you first enter the world of work. And, and again, something which Mohammed Rafi said, also it was about your journey as well and how you, you don't have to compromise yourself. I think that's what you're trying. You don't have to compromise who you are. You just be who you are in that environment. I think it's a very powerful thing there. And also, I love the campaign, Change the Script. Why is this the only time I've heard about it? I think we need to have a talk after. We need to tell that more. But also, can I say to you and Mariam, I think the future is bright. You are two young Muslim women here. And I think I have I've no, you know, I think the future is going to be good. And I think if you two continue what you're doing, and my challenge to both of you is go and start the Muslim Young Networking Group, right? That's your mission today, because if, if, if you could just capture what you both said today and take that out, I think a lot of people will benefit in what you said, especially to what, what, what Mohammed said as well about it is possible to change. So can I thank you for that? It's been really, really great, um, a really great reflection there. Now, we're going to go into, I've got some time to up to some questions. And I'm looking in the chat. So anybody here who, who are participants, if anybody want, uh, want, wants to ask a question of the panel, and if you can put it in the chat, I can pick it up. But my there's a question actually put here. Um, I'm gonna it was to the mayor, but I'm gonna open it up actually to anybody, one of our panelists. And the question is, and the, the mayor's answered it, but the question was: role models are important. However, sometimes young people end up looking in the wrong places for them. 
how do we empower young people to understand the difference between people that are genuine role models and people that are not? And the mayor's given a really great answer. And I wondered whether any of our panelists want to add some reflections to that question and reflecting on what they heard from some of our panelists. Anybody? Mariam, any reflections? Yeah, I could say something if you'd yeah, like. Yeah, far away. Okay, well, um, speaking as a young person, I'd say that when I'm looking at people that I'd like to be like, or when I was, when I was even younger, one of the things I'd look for is relatability. So um, when I was asked to speak on the panel today, for example, I found the word inspirational a bit cringeworthy, if I'm honest, because I don't wake up every day and think, okay, today I'm going to be an inspiration. Um, I just am a young person involved in politics, which apparently is, um, you know, new and revolutionary and, and cool, but it's just who I am. I can't choose to be anyone else. But when I, when I look at my role models, I also don't think that they choose to wake up every day to be inspirational. They're just very relatable to me. They speak like me or they have the same hobbies as me or they're doing things that I think are cool and interesting. So Omar, for example, I've known about his work since I was an undergraduate student and I would go to Ramadan 10 every year. And I think that was inspirational, but I'm sure that he wasn't gonna introduce himself to me and say, hi, I'm Omar, I'm an inspiration to everybody here at this event. Um, so that, that's the main thing for me. It's just the relatability. Okay. And Roxana, did you wanna build on your question and your written response? You're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just such a brilliant question and we're always challenged by, um, you know, assessing others around us based on our own uh, sense of self, but our own uh, deeply rooted values that are shaped by our families and our early year experiences. And um, I, t I totally accept and agree with the point uh, about relatability because uh, there's an authenticity in gen a genuine person. You know, genuine people respond not only to the external, but the, the and their response to the external is actually um, a manifestation of their response to their own internal expectations because they've got a strong a value system that they abide by. And if they haven't followed through on that internal ex expectation that they have of themselves, um, they feel flawed and they adopt a growth mindset to improve. And then they use that lens through which they assess other people. So there's been, you know, I mean, for me, um, by no means am I perfect, but one's, you know, uh, on the basis of faith, uh, whatever faith that you subscribe to, you know, a, a, a core tenant of faith is to um, aspire to be uh, and uh, aspire to be and to follow God's way and how you uh, assess God's way in the context of everything that you do um, every single day of your life and how you grow, grow and then you, uh, you know, adapt or adopt a growth mindset. So, you know, every night I reflect back on my day and I think, oh, was that, you know, did that align to my moral compass, which is shaped by what I understand God expects of me. And if it doesn't, okay, how do I improve? And similarly, when I consider and observe the actions of other people that I may follow or choose not to follow, it's predicated on that sort of, you know, uh, basis. So I trust that helps. You love it. Mohammed, you, your turn to ask a question, you know, if you wanna, any questions in the chat or do you, any reflections you feel you wanna ask the panelists? Okay. Okay. Uh, um, 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 to Omar Sal um, Sahal, it was mentioned that you are facility member for the Islamophobia Research and document um, Documentation Project. What were your key findings? 
Thank you very much, Mohammed. Yeah, it is a bit annoying. It's a very long, uh, long uh, title. Um, the short title is IRDP, but yeah, it's uh, they're ba based in uh, California, uh, in the uh, um, west coast of, of the US, um, in Berkeley. And the, uh, the, the project actually is, uh, runs on an annual basis. So there's an annual uh, International Islamophobia Conference, uh, which I attend uh, and I'm part of the faculty there. And so year upon year, the, f the findings, the research done is, is, is quite uh, um, uh, wide, the variety of different uh, issues and themes and topics we look at. So um, we look at, uh, uh, for instance, contemporary research, looking at um, the role obviously in uh, the US, or so Islamophobia in the context of the US, Islamophobia in the context of Europe, in UK, of course, they all have different contextual uh, underpinnings. But ultimately what I find really interesting from all of those is um, there isn't one definition of Islamophobia, which is often quite a, the, the topic that we come across. However, we see it, we feel it, and we know it exists. And so what I find really fascinating is academics, scholars, community activists, all coming together and convening to share their understanding and obviously uh, adding their contributions towards this rich uh, and important topic to um, uh, ex you know, extend the research area within Islamophobia. I mean, for me personally, for example, I, I, my, my PhD, as um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Terry mentioned earlier um, at the beginning, at the top of the evening, was looking at obviously Muslim football players and, and how they are ambassadors of faith. And um, a research study which was done by Stanford University in Liverpool found that um, since Mohamed Salah uh, joined Liverpool Football Club, um, rates of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate crimes had decreased uh, since he attended. So that's, I mean, of course, you, you can say there is some sort of correlation, whether it's a direct correlation or obviously other matters which are done on a local, national and uh, a global scale in terms of policy. Uh, but certainly his effects both on and off the pitch um, have contributed to this sense of bridging between one another. Um, and before Mohammed Salah, there was Dembaba, if people are familiar with, who used to play for Newcastle. And one of the areas which voted leave, high concentration of vote leave uh, votes in the Northeast of England. Uh, and um, you have 50,000 fans singing Dembaba's name in about the month of Ramadan. And so the Sujood prostration prayer, which is now part of the widely acclaimed FIFA game every year where you can actually score a goal and celebrate. So I think all of this in terms of popular culture is phenomenal. And I think, I think I'm quite fascinated when I look at popular culture and intersection of that um, with, uh, with you know, Muslim identity. I say that because whether it's British, uh, American or Asian, it, it, it's, its roots and it's also overlap in these areas um, putting identity and faith at the, at the core uh, of all of this really is able to actually um, uh, permeate through those uh, walls of ignorance um, and actually be, bring those walls down. So there's a lot, of, I mean, I would highly recommend searching on the website, Islamophobia doc Research Documentary, Documentation Project, so it's ID, IRDP. If you search IRDP uh, US, UC Berkeley, you'll come across several articles and research papers uh, on there with so many of the many rich findings. Well, wow, what a great question, Mohammed. I'm just going to bring in Claire in a moment, but just as Omar, what you said there, there was, I remember watching uh, a YouTube and the Liverpool fans have a quote and they said, if it's good, at, they talk about Islam and they were saying, if it's good enough for some Salah, it's good enough for me. And the, the cop, you know the one I mean, if it's good enough, and that was quite powerful. And I remember watching literally Anfield singing basically honouring Salah on the pitch and all saying they all want to be Muslim because if he can play football like that, they want to be it as well. And I think you're right. And I think football has that power. And I think also on the, on the flip side of it, people are becoming much more respectful. I, don't remember, there was a, I forget the names. There were two Muslim cricketers and they won the 2020 and some of the players sprayed sh um, champagne over them, right? And they, you can see them pull back and the guys carried on. And actually the cricketing authorities admonished the players for spraying champagne over the, over the cricketers because they weren't respectful of them and their culture and identity. And I don't think that would have happened even two years ago, right? I don't think in a very short period of time, but something is happening 
And I think people are being more respectful. And I think sport is something where it allows a window where people can change and have a touch point. So it's a very good example. Claire, I want to bring you in because actually in the chat, I wish I could, you know, put it. Have you got any reflection? I think your videos tonight have opened up quite a lot of conversation. And I wondered if you got any reflections and what you've heard today and you've been in the chat answering questions. And then, I'm, yeah, have you got any reflections at all? I suppose people, if they don't get answers, they don't understand, um, if they don't know things, I'm a teacher, so it's about knowledge and knowledge, I think, is empowerment and can overcome ignorance. So where there are gaps, then it allows mistruth and things that aren't true to be seen as true because they don't know any different. So if I give you my really silly example, um, this is about my mum and dad. My mum's passed away now, but this is many years ago and I've done a call in show on Ramadan FM. Well, hey, uh, and <laughs> about RE in the curriculum. And I've done that annually for years and years and years. And one year, my mum and dad found out. Now, my parents are on the Isle of Wight, and I've told you it's white in more than one way. Now, they haven't got any reference points to Muslim friends or Muslim people. And my parents are lovely people. Um, you know, they've brought me up well, and they've been really inclusive and given me a really good sense of identity and enough resilience to be able to cope with all sorts of things in life. So good people. But when they heard I was on Ramadan FM, I said, oh, you can't do that because, you know, some nutter will try and take you out if you say anything they disagree with. Now, where do my parents get that from? You know, these are nice people, good people, uh, but it's just come out of their mouth. Now, that started a huge conversation for me about their lack of knowledge of Muslim people. But if you don't live with people, um, you know, uh, you don't know about people. And so it's really important that people get doors that open, windows that open into other people's worlds. So for me, that's why I'm so passionate about RE. That's why I've been an RE advisor for 20 years. I, I love doing it in Newham, but it's about people being able to see into other worlds. So whether it's different colleagues here talking about role models, whether it's talking about getting things into normality, Terry, I hate to use that word, but yeah, that we understand each other in difference. And I, I think a, a big part of this has been the Equalities Act in 2010. And I think another part of it is then in 2014, sort of the, the, the public duty or the public sector around that Equalities Act. And I think that's what trips on some of these things, Terry, is people then become more aware as training happens. And it has to happen on every level. And I really love the fact that young people don't want to settle for second best. And so the more of their voices we can get out there, absolutely brilliant. And I would say all of us on this call are here tonight as panellists, not because we're anything big or great, but because people have taken time with us and mentored us and helped us to find our voice. And so if we can help young people to find their voice, you know, the world's going to be better because most of them would want to do the right thing. And most of them will be those who can, um, yeah, take us forward and, and keep improving our societies. But it does it does need all these different things to happen for that to happen. Sorry, that's a bit of a waffle. There. Lovely. No, no, no. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to hand over to the main man, which is Mohammed, who's the key presenter tonight. I'm only his sort of wingman. But I just want oh, to thank you. <laughs> if I just can just to round up and, and just to hand over to the main man. Don't worry, Mohammed. We will be at Hollywood soon doing the Oscars, me and you. Don't worry. But I just want to say that from the video, again, what what Claire's video, the, the comment I got, I have everything that is trying to silence me. From Omar, it's not just about the bridge, it's about the ability to walk across the bridge, which is important, and I think it's very powerful. From Mariam, it's about challenging those assumptions and important to provide platform to others. You know, to Mohammed Rafi, you know, it is possible to change no matter where you are in your journey, just make that change. And to Nalufa, you know, her battle cry, if I could call it, to young Muslims, you know, let's let's tap into that talent. Okay. 
And I think this has been a fantastic event tonight. It's been, you know, I've, I've taken away a lot. And I'm going to hand over to the main man, which is Mohammed, who's brilliant. And Mohammed, over to you. Well, and thank you're going to you. close tonight. Okay. Thank you, Terry. So that's all we have left to say. Thank you. And um, thank you to all um, our speakers, especially everyone watching from home. We appreciate you being here. Um, we hope you found this information and dialogue valuable. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you next Monday. Good night, everybody. Bye. Oh, also, wait, one thing. I forgot. <laughs> one last event as, um, one last event. Go on, Mohammed. go on. Yeah, as a part of Nyon's Islamophobia Awareness Month 2020 is on um, Monday, 30th of November. It is a free film screening in, of Prisha following questions for the first to King movie to address hatred and Islamophobia. For the latest information, please visit www.newam.gov.uk slash I am 2020 when you, where you can register for, um, for this final event and watch the recordings of past events. Now you can so now I can wrap up. Sorry. And, um, and I just... Thank you to Anna as well. Bye all. Thank you, Anna. Bye. 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 See you guys. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Be safe.